All right, Sagar, what's on your radar? Well, Crystal and I, we covered the epic freakout that ensued yesterday after a group of journalists, intellectuals, and authors signed an open letter in Harper's Magazine declaring their commitment to free speech and a liberal society that upholds open debate. And I can't really imagine how anyone on earth could find such a statement such as, quote, the way to defeat bad ideas is by exposure, argument, and persuasion, not by trying to silence or wish them away, controversial. But in any way, here we are. Well, the freakout continued the next day in two very revealing but important ways, which demonstrate why the letter was so needed in the first place and demonstrates just how out of control cancel culture really is at the highest echelons of American culture, which you can be absolutely sure is going to trickle down to affect your life in some way in just a few short years. The first episode involves Vox editor Matthew Iglesias, who signed the Harper's letter alongside other prominent signatories like Noam Chomsky, J.K. Rowling, and Malcolm Gladwell. Iglesias is probably best characterized as a left neoliberal, and although he hates rising, he's an all-around smart guy who has a penchant for being incredibly annoying online. But annoyance, nonetheless, Iglesias did not deserve what was coming his way. As Les covered yesterday, after Iglesias' signature was revealed on the Harper's letter defending free speech in an open society, Vox staffer Emily Vanderwerf tweeted out a public letter that she had reportedly sent to her bosses, saying that as a trans woman, she now felt unsafe at the same company as Iglesias because other so-called anti-trans voices were among those who co-signed the letter. Vanderwerf claimed that she did not want to see Iglesias punished in any way. But well, we all know what she was doing. When you say you feel unsafe in the workplace, you are trying to get somebody fired. She claimed in her open letter Iglesias would suffer no consequences. And yet, hours after her open letter went out, Iglesias, who is a prolific tweeter in his own right, deleted all of his tweets since 2014 and made a public declaration that would only have, quote, good tweets from now on. Even this public submission was not enough for those inside Vox. Ezra Klein, the literal co-founder of Vox alongside Iglesias and supposedly his best friend of like 10 years, took a very public shot at him, tweeting, quote, a lot of debates that sell themselves as being about free speech are actually about power. And there's a lot of power in being able to claim and hold the mantle of free speech defender. Klein was clearly trying to convey what he saw the letter as a cynical ploy, because apparently there is something to be gained from trying to stand up for free speech and a free exchange of ideas, letting people that you disagree with have a point of view in public. Now, you can take it from two very experienced people here on this show that just talking into an echo chamber to people who already agree with you is far easier and more comfortable than trying to engage with people on the other side. But the Klein tweet became even more remarkable when Iglesias quickly tweeted back at Klein and deleted, quote, should I reply to this with a concrete example or stick to my commitments to you? In an all but fleeting public admission that he had been internally chastened and told to no longer publicly discuss his commitment to a free and open society. It is chilling that one of the largest online liberal institutions, that one of their most prominent staffers, has been all but silenced on a vital topic of discussion. And the second episode, which was surrounding this letter, was equally chilling. It involved the author of the statement itself, whose name is Thomas Chatterton Williams. Now, Williams came under attack by a hyper-woke white leftist, Diana Anderson, who said that Williams was a, quote, mixed-race man heavily invested in respectability politics. In a thread that insinuated that his mixed race meant he could not fully understand his words, demanding free speech were not a, actually an attack on people of color. Now, Williams quickly retorted that in another area, she might, area, era, she might as well have called him uppity. And Intercept journalist Lee Fong correctly remarked, there's a toxic culture promoted by the far right, journalists and a growing number of lefties that values you not on your merits, but on your racial identity. So now debates on any topic can be settled by questioning the racial authenticity of a writer. Those two incidents they take in together, it demonstrates just how toxic of a political moment that we're in, and it's exactly what I predicted from the start. Woke critical race theorists have taken up all of the oxygen in our political discussions to push a narrative that if you dare to stand up for fired academics who publish or cite research, which is contrary to the dominant ideology of so-called anti-racism, that you will be silenced at your own outlet, even if you're literally the guy who started it. 
If you're a person of color with heterodox views, like Thomas Chatterton Williams, like me, well, God help you. Your color status is revoked, largely by angry white leftists online who decide exactly which people of color are allowed to have an opinion and whether it's worth amplifying. I'll end with this great observation from Shadi Hamid. I suspect part of what angers some commentators so much about the Harper's letter is just how involved people of color were. For them, we're only allowed to have one position, and if we diverge from that, we're not truly what we are. For these so-called progressives, they judge us based on immutable identities. We are not individuals, distinguished by what we think and we believe. For them, we're supposed to play our role. We are merely representatives of victimized groups to be both elevated and patronized. I think that was really well said. And Crystal, I mean, you take these two incidents together, I think it's crazy. I mean, Matthew McGlade, you know, he's been tweets all the time. He's like 90 times a day. I yeah. actually honestly wonder where he gets all the time. It's one of those people that I'm like, how are you online like 24 he's hours? He's literally a day? online all the time. <laughs> I deleted all of his tweets. And, I, and then publicly tweeting back at Ezra, be like, should I reply with an example or should I stick to my commitments, commitments to, you. to you? It's like, he was silenced at it, the outlet that he co founded. And he's like, oh, well, you know, it's just me. Like, I'm voluntarily doing this. Like, yeah. get out of here. I think yeah. a lot of this, too, is a response, like in this specific moment, right. but also more broadly during the Trump era. There's been a lot of disingenuous use of this term cancel culture on mm -hmm. the right, right? And it's been, you know, used basically to shield people from any criticism, like, oh, you're trying to cancel right. me, when really you're like, no, dude, I'm just like trying to critique you because yes. you made a bad point, Absolutely. right? And so there's a lot of that. And then especially in this specific moment, you have Trump and you have Tucker out there, like cancel culture is the cultural revolution and, you know, go, which is, if, if, if which Matt, is way out. If but, Matt has to bow down on his own outlet, that's pretty cultural revolution. No, but that's, I mean, to, that goes to say the right way words. out, like beyond. And also, again, they're hypocrites on it. I mean, Trump crushed peaceful protesters in the square right yeah, out which, here. Which I you know, which, You did, yeah. absolutely. And, you know, crushed their First Amendment rights and threatened to send in the military. Tucker's out there saying, you know, people should be thrown in jail for flag burning. So let's not pretend that these are like consistent First Amendment free speech advocates. So people get very uncomfortable about seeing, seeming to give them any aid and comfort. Mm -hmm. And this is a, a dynamic that we see play out, not just in this debate, but in consistently during the Trump era, where liberals in particular feel like everything is so existential that whatever Trump does, good, bad, or indifferent, you got to be on the other side. You got to be way on the other side. You can't grant them anything, like right. any little corner of peace or like grant them any little point whatsoever and on any individual decision I get it because like from a tactical perspective you're like no if they're there we're gonna say that's bad and we're over here but if that is your whole approach to politics if that is your whole approach to ideology if that is your whole approach to your principles then you're not gonna have any principles no. your principles end up being defined in opposition to your enemy which is not a good place to be in general also on this specific issue and why I think it's I think this is so important, even though I don't think this is like the cultural mm -hmm. revolution, like I'm not where you are on that. But why I think you can't give any ground on this issue whatsoever is because if you are a leftist and you look throughout history, this has been used against the left yes. far more often than it's been used against the right. I mean, you think about Vietnam, you think about McCarthyism, you right. think today about BDS, right? If you think that your views are like safe from this, you're crazy. You are crazy. They will come, yeah. I mean, the left, and we saw it, look, what happened at Reddit, Yes. right? Top Oh, trap house. They take Sacrifice. down the Donald, but they also are like, oh, we got to do something on the left so that we look fair and balanced. These tech companies, the like, you know, neoliberal institutional gatekeepers like the New York Times, et cetera, like they're going to they're always going to move in this direction of trying to be like, oh, we're balanced between the left and the right, even when there is no equivalency and it's completely unfair. So if you're Chapo, you're going to be censored. If you're the Donald, you're going to be censored. And the other last thing uh, before I hand it back to you is on the Ezra Klein tweet. And I don't know if we can put it back up yeah. there, but where he's saying, like, there's a lot of power uh -huh. that comes from claiming the mantle of free speech. No, there's a lot of power 
from narrowing the co confines of yes. the debate and That's having power, power over what people are allowed to safely say, where the contours of the debate are allowed to go, and which voices are allowed to like express themselves in the public square. That's real, where the real power comes in. And those who supported Bernie Sanders in the primary or Andrew Yang or Tulsi Gabbard, any other anti-establishment candidate, know that very well because they saw the way that they were shut out, ignored, dismissed, smeared, et cetera, because the debate was over right here in this lane and you're not allowed to be over here saying these things. That's exactly right. And look, it, it, you can say, why are you covering a silly little internecine fight at Fox? It's not silly because that is what is playing out across companies, across the entire echelons of American society. And like you said, Reddit, who do you think these people all read? Who do they take their cues from? The New York Times, same thing. I mean, all of these things matter. Soon these people are going to be in the government if Joe Biden becomes the president. And like you said, they'll always, the anti-establishment left and right will always suffer together because they'll take the Alton Donald and they're going to nuke Chapo. There were actually more people on the Chapo Trap House subreddit, like five times more than there were on the Donald one. But they're their huh. uh, their discussion just killed yeah. for a sacrificial lamb, all because they wanted to appear woke. And so you look at that, and you're like, we are witnessing. That's and it's so funny what Ezra said. There's no benefit to standing up for free speech. <laughs> we can both tell you that. Okay, you get way nothing easier. But like be way, way easier for me to just go on Tucker's show and be like, oh, I hate liberals and all this stuff. Yes, yeah, that's, that's the most comfortable life right. you can live in Washington. Right. And I'm sure it's the same on oh, vice yeah. versa. <laughs> and it's like, there is nothing to be gained, really, from society in order to actually try and engage people who are vehemently disagreeing with you, which is what we actually try to do here and with our guests and so much more. The real power is in deciding free is deciding the narrow strictures of speech yeah. and deciding who can say what, what can be said about X. And that is why academics like David Shore are being fired for citing research done by a black man about police violence in America. That is why academics are spouting this whole thing at Princeton University, one of America's world-class colleges, wants anti-racist review of all studies. That is sheer insanity. That is why they just had to retract a study on police violence um, that disproved some leftist talking points. They retracted it not for any factual errors, but because that it was too controversial. We can't live this way. Yeah. When you're going after empiricism, that's insane. And yet, that is the very heart of what they're doing because that's what, what Iglesias was doing is he happened to be a vocal voice against defund the police. And he happened to be publishing articles and tweeting things against the dominant ideology. And this is what happened to him. And I'm disgusted by it. And same, Thomas Chatterton Williams is a black man who is organizing a speech about, uh, organizing a letter on free speech and basically called, I mean, you know, I'm not even going to say what he was called. It's disgraceful. I get it all the time. That, that Shadi Haman thing was correct, which is that if you don't fall into their strictures and their narrow definition of a good, what a good person of color is supposed right. to look like, then you get your colorhood revoked. And yeah. that is what, I mean, it just I drives think, me crazy. I do think that yeah. point, which was a really interesting one, a part of why the letter was so explosive and provocative to people, even though the content of it, I mean, it's it's like written in a kind of a little bit of a pompous way. Like yes. the, it's a, like a little bit it's annoying. Yeah, it's, yeah, yeah, I mean, it's like annoying to yeah. read, but it's not, it's, it's like innocuous. It's vague. Mm -hmm. Part of why I think it was so uh, explosive for people, like you said, is that there were so many people of color on it. So you couldn't just go to the go-to move, which is, oh, it's white privilege. Yes. Like, how privileged of you. And look, these people are privileged in a certain sense in that they have big platforms. Mm -hmm. Many of them are successful, wealthy, et cetera. But I look at it in the converse. These are people who actually it would be hard to just get them out of the public square. They have big followings, yes. big platforms, independent of their media affiliations or other professional affiliations. They're going to be very hard to silence. So I think it's important that people in that position do speak up for those who are much more vulnerable to this, who actually could be completely pushed out, fired, and never heard from again. So I kind of look at it yeah, the reverse there. I think that's a smart way to look at it. Next on Rising, why is former Sanders campaign manager Fat Shakir calling Congressman Richard Neal a great symbol of the problem of corporate monopolies? He's going to join us to explain why when Rising continues.